Welcome to Class Talk, Law for Sustainable Cities, a podcast where we navigate the currents of cities, law, and environmental sustainability. In this podcast, we venture into different urban and environmental legal themes and feature special guests, including our own class researchers. For those who may not know, CLASS is a researcher under the National Research Foundation's Researcher Initiative and operates under the Faculty of Law at the Northwest University, South Africa. My name is Dr. Rumbizai Wendy Musangaza. I am a postdoctoral research fellow at CLASS and your host for this session. Our theme for today is testing the waters, and we will be plunging into the critical topic of water governance with two esteemed guests, Prof. Hemery Filayun and Dr. Melandri Stienkamp. Prof. Filayun is a professor at the law faculty here at the Northwest University, and Dr. Stienkamp is a researcher at the Global Environmental Law Center at the University of the Western Cape. Prof. Hemery and Dr. Melandri, thank you for honoring our invitation. It's a pleasure to have you on the podcast today, and we look forward to a very enriching discussion. Thank you, Dr. Wendy. Water is indeed a vast and vital topic, and we are eager to share insights and promote discussions on this podcast and beyond, especially as we test the waters of understanding South Africa's legal and policy frameworks surrounding this critical resource. Okay, so to kick off our discussion and set the context, Prof. Leon, could you briefly highlight the key laws that shape sustainable water governance in South Africa? Sure, Dr. Wendy. Um, at the outset, I think it's safe to say that South Africa's water governance is rooted in a comprehensive but structured legal framework, though it operates within a more complex governance structures. So at the core of South Africa's water governance framework is the Constitution, which guarantees the right of access to sufficient water in the Bill of Rights. The Constitution also establishes a constitutional structure, which defines the division of powers across national, provincial and local governments. In the water sector, each of these spheres has its own functional area of legal authority. But water governance is primarily the responsibility of national government. This means that the National Department of Water and Sanitation, or the DWS, oversees the overall management of the country's water resources. The DWS operates through provincial offices, Although provinces themselves hold no direct constitutional authority in water matters, instead, the provincial offices rather assist in implementing the national policy objectives. But the specifics of national authority in water governance are further defined in the National Water Act, 36 of 1998. Meanwhile, local governments are responsible for providing water services, such as domestic water supply and sanitation. And this is governed by the Water Services Act of 1997. So while the Department of Water Affairs and Sanitation manages broader governance and you know, resource allocation for purposes like irrigation, industrial use, and bulk supply to, to local governments, for example, local municipalities are tasked with ensuring households have access to clean water and sanitation. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, in taking this dialogue forward, I would like to frame the discussion around some of the water scarcity challenges noted by our former Minister of Water and Sanitation, Mr. Senzom Chunu. The former minister emphasized that around 75% of the country's surface water is already in use, which highlights how critical the situation is. 
While the national balance of untreated or raw water remains relatively stable, significant deficits persist at local level, especially in drought-stricken regions like Kebega and Cape Town. These issues are, of course, also compounded by climate change, which is increasing the frequency and severity of droughts, impacting water availability. So as a follow-up question, Prof, in your opinion, how does the government's mandate as set out in the current legislation align with the urgent need for the sustainable use of water, particularly in the context of the local deficits and the increasing pressures of climate change. Wendy, in light of these challenges of water scarcity, you know, especially at local level and the need for sustainability, as highlighted by the former minister, your question about how the government's mandate aligns with these critical issues is key. To address this, it is essential to once again turn to our Supreme Constitution for guidance. From both a sustainability and access perspective, the Constitution, particularly in sections 24 and 27, guarantees two key human rights that are relevant here. Section 24 establishes the environmental right, ensuring that everyone has the right to an environment that is not harmful to their health and well-being. However, the Constitution goes further by mandating the protection of the environment for the benefit of present and future generations. And this includes measures that secure sustainable development, for example. Section 27, on the other hand, guarantees the right of access to sufficient water. And a careful interpretation of these provisions reveals a direct and positive obligation or mandate on the state to manage water resources in a sustainable manner that meets the needs of both current and future needs. And the National Water Act further elaborates on the state's mandate to ensure sustainable water access. As I've discussed in several of my research outputs earlier, the Act specifically enshrines this responsibility through the concept of public trusteeship, meaning that the national government holds the country's water resources in trust for the people, ensuring their equitable and sustainable use. And this commitment is reflected in various other legal requirements of the Water Act as well, which prioritise the protection of water ecosystems, equitable access and efficient management. In practice, a key feature of the legal framework is the establishment of catchment management agencies. Now, although their full potential has yet to be realised in South Africa, CMAs allow for localised management of water resources at a local catchment level. And this approach, of course, enables adaptive strategies to address specific water deficits and the impacts of climate change in the different regions. So uh, while I believe the legal framework is well aligned with sustainability principles, significant challenge do remain particularly around political interference, resource limitation, and implementation gaps, as I am sure this podcast will further explore. Thank you very much, Prof. Now, coming to you, Dr. Stian Kapp, considering the legal framework that Prof has just discussed, how do you see the role of policy development and enforcement in addressing localized water shortages? Are there any recent policy shifts or strategies that show promise in improving sustainable water governance at both national and local levels? Thank you for that question, Dr. Wendy. The legal framework Prof. Yun outlined provides a solid foundation, but as she rightly pointed out, implementation remains a challenge. Policy development and enforcement play a crucial role in addressing localized water shortages, as well as also promoting sustainable water governance. A well-structured and enforced policy framework can also provide the necessary guidelines and incentives for sustainable water management. 
In recent years, several policy shifts and strategies have aimed to improve water governance. These include our National Water and Sanitation Master Plan, which was launched in 2018, and this plan provides a comprehensive approach to water management. It addresses issues like infrastructure maintenance, water quality, and equitable access. This plan also emphasizes the need for better coordination between national, provincial, and local governments to tackle water challenges effectively. Then we also have the National Water Resource Strategy, which is recognized as the primary mechanism to manage water across all sectors of society towards achieving national government's development objectives. This strategy has also emphasized the importance of integrated water resource management and promotes the development of water resource plans at various levels. Then quite significantly, South Africa also has a national water security framework, which provides a strategic roadmap for ensuring South Africa's water security and outlines key objectives, strategies, and actions to address water challenges. This includes addressing scarcity, pollution, and climate change. It also emphasizes integrated water resource management, but also water demand management and infrastructure development. And then South Africa's National Climate Change Adaptation Strategy recognizes the impact of climate change on water resources and aims to build resilience in our water systems. It also includes measures like diversifying water sources, improving water storage, and promoting water-sensitive urban design. And then we have the Blue Drop and Green Drop certification programs, which have been revitalized to improve water quality management, as well as wastewater treatment at the municipal level. These also provide a clear framework for monitoring and enforcing standards. But what we are also seeing is several innovative approaches from municipalities in drafting water strategies, implementing smart meters for water conservation and demand management, and aligning water planning with their climate action plans. But I do also want to add that policy and enforcement alone are not enough. There must also be a focus on building partnerships with the private sector, civil society and communities to foster a culture of water conservation and shared responsibility. Thank you very much, Dr. Stian Camp. Um, now, against the water governance framework, let us dive in a let us dive in a bit deeper in South Africa service delivery crisis at local and municipal level specifically. So looking at the 2022 census report, a rather mixed picture is portrayed. While national access has reportedly improved, more than a third of South Africa's households face unreliable water supply, with the Northern Cape, Northwest, Pumalanga and Limpopo experiencing the most frequent and prolonged disruptions. The latest blue and no no drop reports also indicate a deterioration in drinking water quality since the last reports in 2014. In addition, the Green Drop Progress Assessment Report shows declining performance in municipal wastewater treatment systems. Coming to you, Prof. Leon, how would you assess the government's progress in fulfilling its constitutional obligation to provide access to sufficient water, especially given these statistics from the 2022 census and the various water quality reports? Now, that is a loaded question. <laughs> I think before we can really assess the government's progress in fulfilling its constitutional obligation to provide access to sufficient water, it is important to understand from a legal perspective, at least, that this, that Section 27, constitutional right to water, is not absolute. It is qualified by the requirement that the state must take reasonable legislative and other measures within the limits of its available resources to progressively realize this right. This means that while the right to water is constitutionally recognized, its fulfillment depends on the state's capacity and available resources. And the measures or actions taken must be reasonable and aimed at gradually improving access. So when we evaluate the government's progress in light of this legal standard, I believe there is much to acknowledge and much to be celebrated. According to the 2022 census, significant strides have been made in expanding water supply in South Africa. The percentage of households without access to piped water has been halved from 19.7% in 1996 8.7% in 2022. 
However, this being said, I believe there is an additional important layer, one on policy and strategy that we must consider. We are all familiar with the National Development Plan, which sets out key goals for eliminating poverty and reducing inequality by 2030. And access to clean running water is identified as one of the enabling milestones in this plan. And alongside the National Development Plan um, timeframe, South Africa is committed to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its Sustainable Development Goals. And one of these goals specifically targets achieving universal and equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water for all by 2030. So against these targets, the critical question is then, of course, whether the government is on track to meet these commitments, especially given the current state of and challenges in water service delivery. And unfortunately, this situation raises concerns. Over the past 26 years, the government has managed to provide piped water to only 11% of households. And with just six years remaining to meet its target, an additional 8.7% of households still needs to be reached. I've never been very good in maths, but according to basic calculations, and unless the government significantly accelerates its efforts and addresses the root causes of delays and slow progress, I think it's unlikely to achieve these goals of access to water to all within the remaining time frame. Mm, that gives us much to think about. Thank you, Prof. And um, so coming to you, Dr. Stian Camp, while Prof has touched on the legal frameworks and other commitments of the state in regards to service delivery, can you help us understand further the practical challenges behind water delivery? What are the main issues that municipalities face in ensuring a reliable water supply and how are these linked to the broader infrastructure and management problems. How would you evaluate the government's progress in fulfilling its constitutional obligation in urban contexts? Thank you, Dr. Wendy. I would say that the practical challenges behind water delivery in South Africa are multifaceted and interconnected. While the legal framework and state commitments are clear, as Profil Unit has outlined, the on-the-ground reality often remains very complex. We have issues that are related to aging infrastructure, with many municipalities grappling with outdated and poorly maintained water infrastructure. Some of these systems are between 50 and 100 years old, which constantly leads to frequent breakdowns and water losses. Then there's the issue of non-revenue water, where we are losing a significant amount of water due to leaks, theft and metering inaccuracies. The national average for non-revenue water is around 41%, which is well above the international best practice of 15%. And then many municipalities also face a shortage of technical expertise to manage complex water systems effectively. And this is particularly acute in smaller municipalities, where in which attracting and retaining skilled personnel remains very challenging. And then this mismanagement and poor governance with the mismanagement of funds and resources, coupled with political interference, which further exacerbate inefficiencies in water service delivery. And then municipalities also face significant financial constraints, which are linked to revenue collection issues and municipal debts, with many municipalities often struggling with limited budgets, collecting payments for water services, and other constraints which have led to high levels of municipal debt to water boards and water suppliers. And then other significant issues are rapid urbanization, especially in major cities like Johannesburg and Cape Town, which put immense pressure on already strained water systems. And as climate change intensifies, South Africa also experiences more frequent and severe droughts, particularly in water scarce regions. This also exacerbates existing problems and makes water management more challenging for municipalities. And then we also see municipalities facing significant governance issues with insufficient management, a lack of accountability, and in some cases corruption, which have hampered effective water service delivery. 
So while significant progress has been made in extending access to pipe water, many urban areas still face unreliable water supplies. And the issues of aging infrastructure, financial constraints and poor governance create bottlenecks that hinder sustainable service delivery. And although urban centers may be better resourced than rural areas, the strain that is caused by rapid urbanization and a growing population complicates efforts to maintain a reliable and consistent water supply. So I believe that unless there is a strategic focus on improving infrastructure and increasing capacity at the municipal level, as well as addressing broader governance issues, progress towards fulfilling the constitutional obligation of providing reliable water will remain slow, particularly in urban contexts, and that the government's approach to water service delivery in cities must therefore be adapted to the realities of increased demand, water scarcity, and climate change challenges in order to meet our 2030 goals. Thank you very much, Dr. Stenkamp. So in response to these and other challenges, in November 2023, the Minister of Water and Sanitation published the National Water Amendment Bill to strengthen the department's regulatory role and address some of the country's water challenges. Prof. Leon, if you could please provide us with a brief overview of the key provisions and objectives of the bill and how it aims to address the country's socio-economic water issues. So the National Water Amendment Bill and the Water Services Amendment Bill, published on 17 November 2023, propose significant changes to both the National Water Act of 1998 and the Water Services Act of 1997. And these proposed amendments are designed to improve water resources management, protect critical water resources, and promote socioeconomic development, specifically by addressing long-standing racial and gender disparities in water access. From the Department of Water and Sanitation's perspective, these amendments are crucial for achieving equitable allocation and improving overall water governance. Key provisions in the bill uh, seeking to amend the National Water Act, for example, include ensuring equitable water allocation, prohibiting undesirable private water trading practices, extending the review period for the National Water Resources Strategy to 10 years, and introducing regulations for protecting water source areas and reallocation of water. But when you specifically asked about the socioeconomic impacts of the bill, and to this end, I believe one of the most significant socioeconomic provisions is its focus on redressing past discrimination through water use licenses. However, if you read the comments by various stakeholders that have since been submitted on the bill, some of them heavily criticized or rather questioned the substance and detail of this specific amendment. But nevertheless, I think after refinement, it may have a better impact on addressing South Africa's socioeconomic challenges. On a positive note, the amendment to Section 2 of the National Water Act, which includes climate conditions in the management of water resources is a welcomed development. And I also think the proposed stricter protection of water or of strategic water source areas is also a notable improvement. The amendments, to, uh, the amendments to the Water Services Act are also promising as they aim to ensure that water services authorities such as municipalities operate and manage water services with greater efficiency and transparency. Thank you so much, Rob, for that. So coming to you, Dr. Stienkamp, what potential impacts do you foresee this bill to have on improving water delivery? Do you think it offers effective solutions to address the water crisis? And how might it influence water governance moving forward? Thank you, Dr. Wendy. The National Water Amendment Bill indeed introduces vital regulatory challenges aimed at improving water governance in South Africa, particularly in sectors like mining, forestry and agriculture. 
its proposals to restrict harmful activities and impose penalties for environmental damage mark a strong effort to protect water resources. However, these provisions lack alignment with the broader framework of the National Environmental Management Act, which governs environmental protection in South Africa. This misalignment could complicate enforcement and coherence between environmental and water governance frameworks, especially in holding municipalities accountable. Furthermore, the bill addresses water use rights and equitable access, but it falls short of com comprehensively tackling the fundamental challenges related to infrastructure decay and service delivery fail failures. These are critical issues, especially at the municipal level, where many local governments lack the financial and technical resources that are necessary for effective water management. So mismanagement, outdated infrastructure and corruption continue to plague water delivery systems, and the bill does not provide sufficient solutions to directly confront these systemic problems. And these cha the challenges of service deliveries, service delivery goes beyond policy changes. We need proper investment in infrastructure, skilled management and account accountability at local government level. Additionally, enforcement is also a major concern. Even with the bill's strong regulatory language, the Department of Water and Sanitation has historically struggled with oversight and implementation, especially in underserved communities. I must add, however, that the bill aims to provide for better separation of water service authorities and water service provider functions. It also introduces mechanisms for the minister to enforce compliance within water service institutions, such as water boards and water service providers. And this will allow for the minister to rectify situations where these institutions fail to fulfill their obligations. So the real challenge lies in ensuring that these reforms translate into practical changes on the ground, especially in municipalities that are already under-resourced and struggling with basic service delivery. So therefore, while the bill strengthens regulatory control, its effectiveness will largely depend on addressing the deeper structural weaknesses in the water governance system. So I think only time will tell whether or not the bill will have a positive or negative impact on water service delivery in South Africa. Thank you very much for that. And I think thus far we have a lot of insight on water governance issues in South Africa. But as my final question to both you, Prof, and to Dr. Stiankam, given the ongoing water delivery challenges and the efforts to realize the constitutional right to water, how do you envision the future of water governance in South Africa evolving? What role should the government private sector and civil society play in solving this crisis? I'll start with you, Prof. Well, I believe that local government will need to play a more proactive role in water governance moving forward. And recently, we've seen a trend towards the criminal prosecution of municipalities for failures in water management, which is a relatively new and significant development in ensuring accountability. This shift could drive more rigorous oversight and enforcement of water management practices. In addition to this, and I think this will be my last contribution um, from my side, and that is that government, including all its organs and delegates, must enhance and support mechanisms to ensure effective local governance in the water sector. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Dr. Stian Kamp. I agree with Prof. Yoon that local government will play a crucial role in the future of water governance. And to build on that, I believe that the future of water governance in South Africa hinges on collaboration between government, the private sector and civil society. Each of these has a critical role to play in addressing the ongoing water crisis, but the success of any reform will definitely depend on a holistic approach that tackles both systemic issues and the need for innovation in water management. So on the part of the government, the focus should not only be on creating more regulations, but also on building capacity at the local government level. And in the private sector, there is an opportunity to bring innovative solutions such as technology for water conservation, infrastructure management and public-private partnerships to support sustainable water service delivery. And civil society should remain a key player in holding both government and the private sector accountable, advocating for transparency, and supporting community level initiatives that promote equitable access to water. So overall, the future of water governance needs to be rooted in a collaborative, multi-stakeholder approach that addresses both governance and infrastructure issues. So without fixing the underlying structural challenges such as corruption and mismanagement, no single sector can solve this water crisis um, by themselves. 
Thank you very much for that. And that brings us to the end of our session today. Thank you so much, Prof. Le Yun and Dr. Stienkamp for shedding light on the pressing challenges and potential solutions to South Africa's water crisis. From today's discussion, it's clear that while our legal framework provides a strong foundation, the path to sustainable water governance requires a more effective implementation, stronger regulatory oversight and active collaboration across government, the private sector and civil society. So as we navigate the uncertainties posed by climate change, resource limitations and increasing demand, the responsibility to safeguard our water resources rests on all of us. We need to embrace innovative approaches, prioritize equitable access, and ensure that future generations inherit a resilient, well-managed water system. Thank you so much to our listeners for tuning into this episode of Class Talk. We encourage you to stay informed, engage in the conversation, and play your part in shaping, in shaping a more sustainable water future. Please remember to like, follow, share, subscribe, and to interact with us and our guests on our various social media platforms. We can continue the conversation with us and our guests on X, formerly known as Twitter, Facebook, and on LinkedIn. Thank you so much for listening to Class Talk, Law for Sustainable Cities. Please look out for our next podcast, which will be airing soon.